I'm Tobin Grant, I'm on the faculty in political science and I serve as the director in the School of Anthropology, Political Science and Sociology. Um, I want to welcome you here tonight for this conversation. Um, as you can tell, one of the two people here on stage is a professional um, speaker. Um, the other one mumbles and will just kind of work his way through asking questions. Um, and so if you can give me, this, this is my first time doing this. She's um, been doing this a long time, but a lot of you guys will recognize her voice when you hear it from NPR. Um, I want to say one quick thing before I do the formal introduction. Um, after we get done, we're going to have a book signing and there'll be books available um, out here. And so if you just, uh, as soon as we get done, we'll just kind of walk back out, back out to the Corker lounge and do that. I want to welcome everybody to the spring Morton Kinney lecture. Um, this is something that is put on with the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute and I want to thank John Shaw and Carol and Jackie uh, for all their support and putting this together. The Morton Kenny Public Affairs Lecture Series is presented in the spring and fall of each academic year. Um, the late Jerry Malure, who's an SIU alumnus from Murfreesboro, um, Established this in 1995 in honor of two of his political science professors, Ward Morton and David Kenny, um, who inspired him as a student. Um, like I said, he's from Murfreesboro, but he was a professor emeritus in political science at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, Jerry Malure also endowed the Malure Scholarship, um, which is in the College of Liberal Arts, which is um, a, a very hefty endowment, and we really appreciate. Um, um, the, the general support that, that Jerry provided to SIU and all his contributions to the university. It is my pleasure to introduce this spring's Morton Kenny lecturer. Sarah McCammon is a journalist and author whose work sheds light on the complicated intersection of religion, politics, and society in America. Uh, Sarah is a national political correspondent for NPR sure and co-host co oh, co of time. the NPR Politics Podcast. Um, her work delves into all the different intricacies of American politics, social dynamics, cultural nuances, and focusing on things like abortion policy and the intersection of politics and religion. Um, she frequently hosts various NPR news programs. Don't be surprised if you're listening to WSIU to hear her on 1A or Weekend Edition filling in. Um, she joined NPR in 2016 as part of its coverage of the presidential campaign where she provided um, coverage of the Trump candidacy, Republican Party divisions, and the role of religion in politics. And her reporting has documented the political influence of religious conservatives, um, most recently um, with award-winning coverage of the overturning of Roe v. Wade in 2022. Um, her recently published book, um, The Ex-Vangelicals, Loving, Living, and Leaving the White Evangelical Church, offers a compelling exploration of the growing movement away from white evangelicalism. I'm happy to say uh, we can announce tonight that this is an officially a New York Times bestselling book. Um, so she, yeah, made the cut. Yeah, so th those hundred copies out there, no. yeah, they got right over the line. No, um, no, no, it, it, it wasn't a surprise. Actually, it, when we were looking at um, when the timing of it, because the way things work, that, um, but very pleased to be able to make that announcement. Um, so that's official as of this evening. Um, drawing from her experiences growing up in a deeply evangelical family in the Midwest, Sarah provides a unique pers perspective on the ex-evangelical phenomenon, which is a movement away from white evangelicalism. It really is a book only she could write, it is deeply personal and rigorously reported. Um, Though in depth, through in-depth interviews and thoughtful analysis, she delves into the reasons behind the departure of many individuals from the evangelical fold and sheds lights on the tensions within the movement and the challenges faced by those who choose to leave. So please welcome Sarah McCammon. Okay, uh, yeah, trial number two with the mics, okay. Um, so what we thought we'd start with, um, we're talking how to do this is, is you know, the, rather you know, we're gonna do this as a conversation and I'll have some questions to kind of get things started, but we're gonna start with her doing a reading from part of the book to help give it some context. Um, and then, then we'll go for 20 minutes or so and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience because we really want this to be a participation of the community with this, okay. So Sarah, you wanna go ahead and start? Yeah, thank you. And I'm on, right? Yeah. Okay, good deal. Um, so this is from um, 
one of the first chapters in the book, and I'll just jump in. <clears throat> I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. We sing in children's church. We waved our hands to the right, then left, and back again, miming the motion of a flowing river. It was a simple song. We chanted about joy like a fountain, hands sweeping upward, and love like an ocean, fingers wiggling like happy little waves. All because of Jesus. I wanted to feel the peace and joy we sang about and that my mom talked about, but it was often elusive. And when it did come, it felt more like an unpredictable trickle than a mighty river or an ocean. If you'd accepted Jesus into your heart, that was supposed to settle it, I thought. But had I really believed and believed enough? What if I was among the lost? The stakes were far too high to get this wrong. Alone in my bedroom, I flipped through the pages of my lavender Bible, looking for reassurance. I read the words of Jesus in the book of John. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And from 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'd done it all, confessed my sins again and again, my disrespect toward my parents, fights with my siblings, laziness and reluctance to wash the dishes after dinner. I'd prayed the sinner's prayer more than once, but still my heart was troubled. At night, after I'd settled into my twin bed with my little sister asleep in the trundle next to me, my stomach tightened and my mind raced. I was never afraid of monsters. I knew from children's television shows and in books I saw at the public library that other kids were. But monsters seemed kind of silly, especially compared to demons and the devil himself, which were very real and never far away, trying to steal our souls. In the darkness and quiet, I wondered if it was all true and why, if Jesus had come to save the world, so many people apparently would not be saved. Something felt very wrong about that, but to entertain such doubts would be to subject myself to the same fate I feared for them. What if this was the devil trying to lead me astray? What if, despite the prayers and the promises in the Bible and the reassurances of my parents and pastors, I wasn't really saved? And even if I was, and if it was all true, then what? There was still so much to fear. We lived each day with the knowledge that Jesus could come back at any time to take us to heaven in the rapture predicted in the book of Revelation. If and only if we were ready, Jesus would take us up with him into the clouds. The trumpet shall sound, the verse from Matthew promised, and he would gather up his people from all over the earth. This was supposed to be a joyful hope for the Christian, but I was ashamed to feel afraid when I thought about it. I wondered, if I didn't believe quite enough, could I grab my mother's ankles and fly into heaven with her? Would God let me in? And if I did believe enough, what would it mean to be sucked up into the air? The sound of a train whistle or a loud car horn was enough to send me into a panic that maybe this was it, the moment of truth. So I read that because for my evangelical childhood and for many others, the idea that the rapture was imminent, that we could be called to answer before God at any moment was an ever-present idea and reality. And it shaped our entire worldview. And, and the idea that um, it was our responsibility to reach the lost world with this message was, was baked into everything we did. And I talk in other chapters about um, what that meant for interacting with the very few people I knew from sort of outside of this evangelical bubble. Um, and that theological and religious project carried with it very often a, a political project. And I, I, I think many of the, one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I wanted to sort of document what the inside of that world is like for, for so many people, a, a world that's been very instrumental in our larger culture. Yeah. And when, when you talk about the evangelical worldview, <laughs> expand on that a little bit. Like, what part of your life growing up, going through college, you know, as you're going through this, did you consider... How much did evangelicalism touch all the different aspects of your life? It touched literally everything. Um, there was no, uh, there was no sort of separation between um, between our worldview 
and, and anything we did. I mean, my entire world growing up was Christian school, Christian magazines, Christian radio, Christian books, um, Christian television. And, you know, that meant that there were very few sort of apertures into the outside world. And, you know, the reason I wrote this book is I had never really had a language to talk about what that was like, trying to unravel that, make sense of that, as I did you know, grow up and get into the outside world and um, encounter people and ideas that sort of contradicted some of the things I had um, been told. And when I was covering the 2016 campaign and, and reporting on the rise of Donald Trump and reporting on the white evangelical movement, you know, in the back of my mind was this world that I had come from. And I knew how influential it was. I knew how it shaped the thinking of many people from that community. And, um, you know, in the course of reporting out a story about how evangelical women were responding to the Access Hollywood video release, in which, you know, Donald Trump talked about touching women inappropriately, um, I heard this word exvangelical. Someone said, you know, some of us don't feel like the evangelical label works anymore. We, we're using this word exvangelical. And suddenly I realized that there was a whole language and kind of an online community around that same experience of trying to unravel and make sense of this worldview. Yeah, so how, give us a picture of like, when you talk about evangelicals and then when you talk about exvangelicals. So what, how, would you, how would you describe that group of people? As you know, sociologists, yeah. historians, <laughs> demographers, pollsters argue about words like evangelical, what it really means. Um, I've used it very loosely, I think in the same way it's often used in a lot of political reporting. Generally, I'm referring to theologically conservative Protestants. And um, you know, I know there's a religion scholar in the room, and, and we could talk about you know all of this sort of yeah, subsets. One, yeah, yeah and, one of the, and, there's a sociologist, Lydia Bean, and she's written a book, and one of her descriptions of it and, is that even joke, and I would, I would find this useful to explain to people, evangelicalism is less than a ship than it is an armada. You know, there's this whole collection of ships that all seem to be going the same direction, you know, but what are the sort of things that, that like you said, sort of theologically conservative Protestantism yeah. and stuff, then who are the ex-evangelicals as, as, as you've found through your reporting? Well, if I could go back quickly oh, yeah, to please the, to the yeah. armada, I like that analogy. I mean, I think the, the essential idea is, and, and this isn't my formulation, but I think there's one formulation of the definition of evangelical that involves like four basic criteria which have to do with a really strong view of scripture, the authority of scripture usually pretty literalistic and inerrantist, that the Bible is God's word and it can speak directly into our lives, um, the importance of salvation through Jesus, of course, the importance of evangelism, sharing that message with the world, and usually there's some kind of um, outward project. It may be, it may be um, you know, social justice work. There's a tradition within evangelicalism of working towards social justice. It may also be a, a political process, a project, and um, take the form of the kind of activism we've seen in you know, the last several decades, uh, usually toward Republican politics. But um, to, to your question about ex-evangelicals, I mean, again, broadly defined, ex-evangelicals are people who, who are saying, I come from this evangelical subculture. It shaped me. It formed the way I think. It formed the way I think about God, about people of other faiths, about sexuality. That includes homosexuality as well as um, their own sexuality, whatever that may be. Um, often, their relationship with science. Um, there's a chapter in my book about growing up with young earth creationist um, textbooks in my Christian school. Now, not all evangelical are young earth creationists, but many are, and many are influenced by that thinking. Um, and so for myself and for the ex-evangelicals I interview in the book, all of these you know, th these things I described, they're kind of, I, I describe them as themes of cognitive, di cognitive dissonance, tension points, um, moments of sort of coming, sort of intersecting with the outside world and going, okay, this doesn't add up, I need to rethink, re-examine, you know, what I really believe. So, you know, there are stories of people um, struggling with their church's response to racial injustice. There are stories of, there's a, a nurse I interview in the book who, went to nursing school before she realized that um, men and women don't have a different number of ribs because, you know, in the Genesis story, um, Eve is made from one of Adam's ribs. And, and for me, one of the central 
um, characters in the book was my grandfather, who was one of the only non-religious people I knew in my entire world. And um, my relationship with him forced me to really rethink some of the things I was being told. So I, what I found is that the, the reasons that people re-examine their relationship to their faith background are, are manifold, but the experience is very similar. There is often this experience of feeling kind of lost, confused, scared, and having to try to um, sort of, sh it, it's really an identity shift in many ways. And for a lot of people, that process, or at least the public conversation about it, has been catalyzed by the div divisiveness of the past several years and the increasing politicization of the evangelical label. Yeah, and, and so like you mentioned the Access Hollywood video. I heard in one of your interviews you mentioned that when you saw January 6th, that, that was like a catalyst for like maybe why you needed to go further from an idea to like moving towards, like this is the book that you had to write. Like is, is that, is it, did I understand that correctly? And if so, like what was it about January 6th mm -hmm. that when you saw it, you're like, yeah, I, got, I need to do something, like r reporting, like, like writing, not activism, but writing book. Right, right, so um, after, you know, just to back up a little bit, I had spent many years outside of the evangelical world. I, in my early 20s, so I'm in my early 40s, this is 20 years ago, in my early 20s, um, got into journalism, spent a lot of time kind of thinking about what made sense for me and what didn't. And, you know, I, I found myself wanting to work in a space where questions were encouraged and where I could, you know, explore multiple points of view and not have to be sort of stuck to, to preconceived ideas. And so journalism felt like a very safe space where I, I did not want to be an advocate. I did not want to be an activist. And so I didn't talk a lot about my evangelical background. I mean, for one thing, I, I wasn't proud of the fact that I had, I had a lot of gaps in my education, frankly. I had a lot of gaps in my scientific education. Um, I had grown up in a community that was very homophobic. And so I spent many years just really kind of trying to separate myself from that and se certainly separate the professional from the personal. But when I covered the Trump campaign, the, the question of what are white evangelicals going to do around this person, are they going to support him, um, became so central to so much so many of our stories that that I felt like I was kind of you know face to face with my background once again. Um, so I spent a lot of years after after that just thinking about was there something I wanted to say, and I I was so often asked you know as someone with, from an evangelical background, what do you see? How do you explain the rise of Trump and the alignment of the evangelical movement with with Trumpism? Um, um, and so I'd find myself kind of explaining some of the things I grew up with, how evangelicals think, what the worldview is, what the priorities are. And it was January 6th in many ways when I saw people walking toward the Capitol, um, preparing to engage many of them in an insurrection with crosses and signs that said Jesus saves and pictures of Jesus. Um, for me, that was the moment that I said, you know, there is an unmistakable alignment here between these Christian nationalist ideas and Trumpism and the, the right wing of the Republican Party. And I have seen sort of how the sauce is made, and I, I have something I want to say about it. So that was kind of the impetus for it for me. Yeah. And then one, one of the things I, I really appreciate about the book, and so for those of you who haven't read it, it's it's, it's described as a combination memoir and reporting. Um, my read on it is that it's really like it's reporting, reporting. Like even your memoir seems to be like you reporting on yourself, <laughs> right? And so like, how did you interrogate like your own story mm -hmm. as you're going through it? Like, because it doesn't it doesn't come across as I, I listen to a lot of memoirs and it doesn't come across as just kind of like you just kind of writing creative nonfiction. It sounds like like you actually like really looked into like the facts of like even your own story. I love this question because I've been doing this for a week and a half now, and so I, I get a lot of the same questions over and over, and I've never gotten this question. Okay, good. Yeah. It's a good one. That's what you get for having a novice, you know, in, this, in the chair. No, yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's, okay. it, yeah. it's, it's refreshing. <laughs> it's refreshing. Um, yeah, I, I, well, a couple things, right? So as a journalist, I mean, every sentence I write in stories, I like to know where it came from. Like, I like to, I mean, I even double check, you know, not Vice President Kamala Harris's name, but like I check things I think I know yeah. because it's it's so easy to 
have a have an off day and you know transpose somebody's title or misremember something. And so writing a memoir about things that happened 30, 40 years ago is, is a little bit daunting. And so um, I had, like I said, in, in 2017, spent some time just trying to get down some of my key memories, my core memories that I thought really explained why I felt like I had to make a breach with the community of my childhood. And so I, you know, I leaned on some of those, um, which obviously were, were not fresh, but th those were the things that I, the memories that I had would think about again and again and again over the years when I would be asked to explain, you know, tell me about your evolution. Um, and then I did a lot of primary source work. So I went and went online and tried to find as many of my old Christian school textbooks from places like Bob Jones University and Abeka Publishing, which if any of you come from this world, you might recognize. These are very conservative universities in the South that publish um, materials for Christian schoolers and homeschoolers, which were widely used in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up and are still pretty widely used today, many of them. Um, so I bought a bunch of old textbooks. Um, I bought a bunch of books that had been in my home, books by people like James Dobson and Tim LaHaye and other high-profile evangelical leaders because I wanted to be able to, as I was thinking about the, the, the point of view, the world view, I wanted to really be able to um, overlay my memories with direct quotes from the horse's mouth. And so I was able to use those materials to kind of buttress the things that I was talking about. Um, and then I also went and pulled my old journals and papers and yeah. <laughs> emails from my mother. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of other, a lot of other exchanges, um, exchanges with my grandfather, who again is a key character. And so, put, pulling all of that together, I felt made, helped refresh some of my memories and also paint a fuller picture of the world I'd grown up in. And also, I, you know, I, I just, I didn't want people to just take my word for it. You know, I wanted to sort of document, like, like the, the sexism and the, the racism um, and the homophobia, all of those things that so many people I talk to for, who, who call themselves ex-evangelicals have struggled with and been frustrated with, we're not making that up. It's right there in the primary source documents that, that formed our intellectual universe. Was, was there anything that popped out? Because you have a lot of background, both personally and evangelicalism. You've reported on it for a while. But as you started really looking at it on a book link project, were there things about evangelicalism that popped out that, that surprised you? Like things that maybe you didn't realize how extreme something was said or... I think, I mean, I think it's important, first of all, to say that evangelicalism is, a, as we said, it's a big yeah, movement big. made up of a lot of, of, a lot of different um, sort of streams of thought, different sub-traditions, and there's a spectrum. There are more progressive evangelicals. There are evangelicals that believe in evolution, accept evolutionary theory, that are friendlier to gay rights. I mean, they're, they're, they're not one thing. But um, I think what I, ex I had a pretty broad experience with a pretty broad swath of yeah, for, conservative yeah. evangelicalism. So my, um, my church was a non-denominational charismatic church. So that's like speaking in tongues, raising hands, believing in miracles, very emotional, relational kind of um, expression of it. My Christian school that I went to preschool through senior year was um, a little more buttoned down, um, a little more, it was not Southern Baptist, but more Southern Baptist style. And then I went to an evangelical free college, which, um, which was Trinity in, in Deerfield, Illinois, um, which was the undergrad college of a, of a major evangelical seminary that's very influential and has trained pastors all over the evangelical world. So I think I have been exposed to a pretty broad swath of at least Midwestern evangelicalism, and, um, and I think it would be reflective of, of Southern as well. Uh, so having, having caveated it that way, I mean, again, I think going back to some of my, my textbooks from my childhood, I was, I was surprised at how, um, how extreme some of some of the things we were taught uh, were. There's a chapter on race and on black Christians leaving predominantly white churches publicly in the last several years, in part because of Trumpism, because of a sense that their fellow parishioners were voting against their best interests. Um, and I talk in that chapter about 
uh, I go back to some of the textbooks and I talk about the way that slavery was portrayed. And it was, you know, at best, it, it was it was jaw dropping, glossed over, yeah. and at, at worst, it was it was horrifically um, inaccurate. You know, a, in, in a glowing picture, a relatively glowing picture of, of what um, happened. And so, some of those stumbling on some of those things, which. You know, I didn't have a clear memory of anymore because it'd been sure. so many years. Was was pretty shocking. Yeah. One of the other things that struck me in the book is like you, know, you talked about your your church and your school and stuff, but then there's also when you mentioned Bob Jones or Rebecca, these broader movements, but also Dobson's not a small character. James Dobson. James Dobson, mm -hmm. right? And focus on the family. Right. If you want to explain, like, because this is one of those what we would call parachurch ministry or something. You know, it's not in a denomination. It's not part of a church but about some of the ways that that shaped your family and your church and kind of, because sure. you're talking about something that's not specifically in a church, right? But it clearly has political, both political and social influence. Yeah. So in the evangelical world, people are shaped by their, their church tradition, which may be an independent, non-denominational church that's on kind of operating on its own. It may be part of a chain of churches, or it may be part of a larger denominational organization like the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest evangelical denomination in the country, rapidly shrinking, but still the largest sort of single entity. I mean, evangelicalism is sort of by design, decentralized, non-hierarchical, um, you know, unlike the Catholic Church or even the Presbyterian Church, where there's a clear sort of hierarchy and, and um, you know, order of operations, evangelical churches tend to be much more independent. And so there are these big parachurch ministries like Focus on the Family that have exercised huge influence. And um, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of James Dobson, who founded Focus on the Family. Uh, he's no long, He's still alive. He's no longer with Focus. Focus is kind of doing its own thing these days. But, um, you know, James Dobson originally was a psychologist who focused on providing marriage and family counseling to evangelical Christians starting, I think, in the 70s. Um, and certainly by the time I came along in the 80s, he was hugely influential. He was um, writing parenting books, and his, his organization was putting out um, you know, just hundreds of, of books and magazines and uh, all kinds of materials on, on mostly Christian living and family life, and then they expanded into sort of entertainment magazines for, for teenagers and children. And you know, it was all um, it was all centered on this conservative Christian worldview, and gradually over time, uh, Dobson morphed into politics, and he um, focused on the families, founded spin-off groups like the Family Research Council, which still operates today and is, is very influential and has been named a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center because of its views on um, LGBTQ people. Um, but it was, it's, I think, hard to grow up in an evangelical household of that time without Dobson being just a, a household name, a kitchen table conversation. Um, you know, in my house, there was the, the Focus on the Family monthly magazine. There was Citizen, which was the magazine published by the Family Research Council. I got Brio magazine, which was like a Christian alternative to teen magazine. Um, there was Clubhouse, which was a, a Christian version of Highlights, and many, many others. Um, because Highlights is dangerous. I got Highlights, too, okay, I okay, have yeah. to say. <laughs> Um, but we were just enveloped yeah. in this subculture. And and because of that, Dobson became a trusted figure who, you know, amassed a mailing list of millions of people. And so, you know, on the one hand, he was publishing books strongly advocating for corporal punishment, which I talked to a lot of people in the book about the trauma that inflicted, particularly when it was um, it was carried out sort of in the, literally in the name of God. Um, and then he he you know springboarded into uh, into politics and has been hugely influential in in shaping um, the thinking of evangelical political leaders and and so you know he people have compared him to sort of an evangelical pope because of his yeah. influence i mean there are many others but he's he's probably the single most important figure at least in my childhood yeah. Yeah, and then before we turn it over to the audience, I wanted to say that one of the things that I think you do a masterful job in the book, and I've mentioned this to you, is blending your story with also the story of the people that you interview, you know, in a very 
you, you don't find many books that can do it. I haven't read a book that's done it as well as yours, yours has. But it's also, the, like you mentioned, the story of your grandfather lines through there. I wanted to give you an opportunity to just talk about anything you want to say about with your grandfather's story that's here, because I think you do, because um, it's his story, his story's intertwined in that throughout your book. Yeah, so my, my grandfather was born in 1924. He was a neurosurgeon, Harvard trained. Um, he went to Harvard at a time when it had been, I think, maybe at most two decades since Harvard had purged their gay faculty. And he told me this when he was in his 80s when I sat down with him to ask him about his life and um, his experience coming out as a gay man in the 80s after my grandmother passed away. So not only was he the only non-religious, non-evangelical person that we knew, he was, he was gay. And that created um, a tremendous amount of tension in my family and a tremendous amount of consternation um, because my parents had very strong negative views about that. Um, I write about how I found that out that that was the case and found out that that was the reason that I rarely saw him. And um, I write about how our relationship unfolded over the years. Thankfully, he lived a very long life, and um, we had many years together during my adulthood when I was able to get to know him better and understand more about you know who he was and, and how he had you know had his own fascinating journey. You know, he was not an evangelical, um, but he'd grown up at a time when he wasn't able to be who he was. And so, in some ways, um, his story and mine are very different, but. I, I talk in the book about the things I was able to learn from that relationship. Yeah, very touching. How you how, that story is incredible in the book. But um, wanted to thank you, Sarah, for being here tonight and for answering all our questions. Thank you.